Imagine a mini computer with a volume of just one liter. And now imagine that it costs only $100 and you can replace everything in it just like in a regular desktop PC. This is not science fiction. This is one of the most upgradable mini PCs, the Lenovo ThinkCenter M920Q. And today, I'm gonna show you how to turn it into a real beast of compactness and performance. I bought it at the lowest price, and that's why I only have a 65 watt power supply included, which we'll replace later because we'll need much more power. Let me show you what's inside, especially since it's super easy to do here. You just need to unscrew one screw at the back and the lid can be removed. We have so many upgrade options here that there's even a bracket for 2.5 inch SATA SSD drives. Now that's what I call a proper level. I'll remove it for now, just in case. Right now we have that same slot through which we'll be connecting a graphics card in the future. What I've always liked in such small computers is the presence of a local subwoofer. And on the bottom we have a lid that also opens and gives access to upgrading the RAM, of which in my case, well, barely anything. Just one 8 gigabyte stick and a modest SSD with only 256 gigabytes of storage. Next to it, there's also a space for soldering another SSD slot, but that's more for the X version of this mini PC, which I didn't buy, and I'll probably regret that in the future. You'll soon understand why. The cooling system here isn't very powerful, to be honest, and it'll bring me quite a bit of pain in one particular spot. It's fully aluminum and weighs only 77 grams. If you add copper heat sinks, it'll go up to 88, but that's for later. And now take a look at this beautiful socket for Intel 8th and 9th gen processors. This isn't for some weak mobile scraps, but for real powerful desktop CPUs. A socket for processors that can still compete with the latest mobile variants. But obviously, we don't have that kind of CPU in there yet, but we'll fix that. Before doing any upgrades, let's see what it's capable of for just $100. The CPU here, obviously, is a weak Pentium with two cores and four threads, which consumes a laughable 22 watts of power. At the same time, it gets quite hot. Here are the metrics we'll need today. VR VCC, that's the temperature of the VRAM. And as you can see, even with such a weak processor, it heats up to 85 degrees, and that's with only 25 amps of current. Games like vanilla GTA 5 on minimum settings basically run. The keyword is run, but not smoothly. It's a whole different story when you add a second stick of RAM. FPS increases by 50%. So don't forget to install two sticks, especially if you're using the built-in gaming GPU soldered onto the processor. I think you've seen enough. This mini PC doesn't have any trump cards, and now we're gonna give it a couple. I'll start with the CPU upgrade. For that, I will once again remove this pathetic cooling system. I think it would be a good idea to rinse the heat sink under the tap because every degree matters, and as we all know, dust worsens heat dissipation from the heat sink. The thermal paste is almost dry. That's exactly why we saw 85 degrees on such a weak processor. Let's give our Pentium a little rest, and instead, I've got a whole pack of options here. The most interesting one, this beauty. The i7-9700 with eight cores. There's also this i5-8500, which you might have seen in my SSF build video. At first glance, they look like the same processors, but there's a 700 megahertz difference on all cores. So if the i7 doesn't work out, I'll come up with something using these two brothers, especially now that I've got Thermal Grizzly, the liquid metal compound. I bought a whole five grams of this stuff, so it'll last me a lifetime. I'll be smearing it in every appropriate and not so appropriate situation. But for now, let's install our i7 and see what temperatures we get on the stock version of this processor. Of course, for the purity of the experiment, I'm degreasing everything. That way we'll find out whether it makes any sense to apply liquid metal to processors in such small computers. Thermal paste, MX4. And since our processor is 65 watts, we'll need a significantly more powerful power supply. That was sent to me by a subscriber, Alexi. Huge thanks to him. Now that's what I call power. Eight cores, eight threads, consuming a full 85 watts, 60 amps on the VRM. God, it heats up so fast. The processor is obviously at 100 degrees. And there it is, the VRM is overheated, 95 degrees. I tried undervolting the processor, which by the way does work on this computer, but the CPU is just too powerful for this PC and the VRM still overheats. I'm disappointed. 
But not for long, because I installed the 65 watt i5-8500, which I successfully undervolted to 40 watts of power consumption. The difference with the T processor is a whole 700 megahertz, so it's worth fighting for. So let's lock it in. 92 degrees, average temperature, and the maximum, 98. The VRM heated up to 93 degrees in 10 minutes, which is obviously a lot, but this is a stress test, meaning in games, it'll be less. The first thing I want to do is stick copper heat sinks onto these squares. It won't do much, but if the VRM heats up even a bit slower to the critical temperature, that'll already be a success. Looks like we only have three phases here, while this X version has four and the heat sink itself is way better. There, the VRM is in contact with the heat sink through thermal pads, so it has active cooling. Sure, I could have bought that one, but have you seen the price? Are these sellers insane? So I'll make do with what I have. As for the processor, I'm going to delit it now. Since I don't have a delitter, I'll be using a razor blade. It's very convenient for slicing through the sealant holding the processor lid in place. I think I should mention that this is a rather dangerous activity, so if you're not confident in your skills, better don't try this. Also, some processors have SMD components under the lid, which you can easily damage, but sometimes there are no SMD components at all, like in my case. As you can see, it's regular thermal paste in here, but for processors with a K index, there's solder under the lid, so applying liquid metal there makes no sense. You get a one to two degree difference at most if you go through this process. You need to clean the lid and the CPU from the old sealant. This is quite difficult, especially when you're filming everything on camera. One wrong move and you could damage the traces on the CPU. Here's how I managed to clean it. Next, you need to prepare the liquid metal syringe. Specifically, install the needle. Then degrease the areas where the liquid metal will be applied. For that, the kit includes two alcohol wipes. Done. There's a small smudge left on the CPU die, but I think it won't prevent us from properly tinning the metal. The die is ready. Now I'm tinning the processor lid. Since the lid might sit unevenly on the die, it's best to tin an area a bit larger than the die itself, so that in case we place the lid crooked, we still get full contact. Done. Damn chromatic aberrations on the lens don't let you properly see the liquid metal, but I hope you can see the result anyway. Now we open the socket and place the processor without the lid onto the contacts. I want the lid to be glued to the processor, so I'll use bathroom silicone sealant I had laying around. It can withstand up to 100 degrees, so it should be enough for us. Now I place the lid smeared with sealant onto the processor as crookedly as possible to show that our hands grow from the right place. And we press it all together with the socket cover for about 15 minutes. In the meantime, you can go grab a bite. After 15 minutes, the lid is firmly and securely in place. Though it shifted a little to the left, but that's not critical. We put our modified sandwich back in place. Apply, just like last time, MX4. What, did you think I'd smear liquid metal on top too? The thing is, you can't apply it on aluminum, only on a copper base or better, nickel plated. And what could possibly go wrong? Just look at this shame. Only this one spot had contact, and all because I, the genius, somehow managed to screw down the cooler with my powerful electric screwdriver, even though this heat sink was seriously in the way. As you can see, here's the spot where it was hitting, so be more careful. And here's the result. The temperature dropped by four degrees on average and by as much as nine at the maximum. At the same time, the computer got a bit quieter. So liquid metal definitely makes sense. But I've got bad news. The VRM still overheats. So I lowered the processor power a bit more by 200 megahertz and the overheating disappeared. Still a win. Now about everything else. I'll be installing 32 gigabytes of RAM with two sticks. Price $50 or 40 if I sell the eight gigabyte one. And this thing was also sent to me by my subscriber Alexi, completely free. Everyone should have subscribers as generous as mine. I rarely say this to you, but thank you to everyone who watches me. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have the opportunity to do what I do. I love you. You're the best. So this is a special adapter that needs to be connected to the RTX 4060, which even though it has an 8-pin additional power connector, that's actually a plus, because our mini PC can only deliver up to 50 watts of power through the slot. But since our GPU has additional power, it will draw what it needs through this 8-pin connector. Now, to make the graphics card fit, we need to remove some parts from our mini PC, specifically the display port and the rear bracket and this front reinforcement bar. Done! Now we place our RTX 4060 right into this spot. Now what is he doing? How can you mess up like this? Tell me! Forget what you saw! 
Just look how powerful everything looks now. The GPU sticks out of the case a bit. Now, of course, we don't have a 1 liter build anymore. It's a bit more, because I bought a so-called Flex ATX power supply rated at 500 watts. I bought an expensive FSP, of course, but for a single GPU, you could go with a much simpler Chinese PSU, and there'd be no difference. It'll lie like this, or rather stand, because airflow needs to reach the fan. It ended up being about 2.5 liters and no more. The case cover, of course, won't be there. Not because the mini PC already looks cool without it, but because the Chinese refuse to send me a 3D printed one. They want me to work for free. Although, honestly, it'll cool better this way anyway. Now to make the PSU turn on, you need to connect the third and first pins on the main connector. I could have made a simple button to open and close the circuit, but I'm too lazy to do that. So I'll just use a regular wire. Now let's plug in all the wires and see if there are any issues with such a setup. And uh, there are a few. First we turn on the power supply and then the main PC and everything works. Man, the VRM on this board heats up like crazy. Feels like even 35 watts is already too much for it. Anyway, 3.7 gigahertz on the i5. That's the maximum allowed on this PC. As you can see, the game runs quite well, 70 to 80 FPS. Now about the bugs on this system. See how the frequency drops to 800 megahertz? At first, I thought it was the VRM overheating, but no. When the VRM overheats, the symptoms are a bit different. The cooling fan just starts spinning like crazy, and this happens when the VRM hits 95 degrees. But in my case, the VRM temperature was 85 degrees at the time. Eventually, I figured out the real reason. The reason is the GPU power supply. Since this slot only provides 50 watts of power when the GPU is under heavy load, this bug appears. I don't know how it's connected to the CPU, but as soon as I limited the GPU's power limit and did an undervolt, the bug disappeared. Usually, users get a black screen in such cases because the GPU doesn't get enough power. But in our case, there is additional power, so the screen stays on. Long story short, with memory overclocking and undervolting, the card lost 10% of performance, but the issue went away. Then I decided to install the i7 after all, but set it to 3.4 GHz on all cores to avoid VRM overheating. And it turned out to be about 15-20% to faster than the i5. But let's imagine we had an i7-9700 without undervolt, running at 4.2 GHz on all cores. To get that kind of performance, I once again disassembled my mini PC and pulled out that powerful i7 to install it into my SFF computer, which you saw in my previous video. Here, as you can see, there are more VRM squares. If the mini PC could handle things with just three squares, imagine what this board with 12 squares could do. Sorry for the very technical terms like squares. It's just that the Ford is so tiny, I can't read what kind of MOSFETs these are or their specs. But you don't really need that info. What you need is the result. Ooh, now this is what I call an improvement. This motherboard has such a power reserve that you could even install a CPU with a K in the name. 72 amps on the VRM and it only warmed up to 64 degrees, while the CPU is consuming 88 watts. It holds 4.4 gigahertz in the CPU Z test and in games I saw anywhere from 4.1 to 4.5. Well, with a processor like that, you can already game comfortably. Basically, we would have gotten this kind of performance if we had the M920X, because it has one more power phase and active VRM cooling. But the question arises, do we really need that much power in such an old mini PC where we have limitations on the GPU? My opinion, we don't really need it that much considering that this i7-9700 alone costs $100. Now, let's calculate the total cost. Mini PC, $100. i5, $35. 32 gigabytes of RAM, $50. Riser, $10 if bought from AliExpress. Mini PC power supply, $20. GPU power supply, I'll count $50 even though mine costs $100. Graphics card, $280. Total, $545 for a mini PC with a volume of about 2.5 to 2.75 liters. You can calculate it yourself. 8 times 18 times 19 and subtract the space where there's no power supply. Well then, hope you enjoyed the video. Write in the comments which PC you'd like to see in the next video. See ya!